Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Chris DeFay, a member of the Authors at Google team here in Santa Monica. Today I'm pleased to introduce, uh, as part of our Tech Talk series, uh, Bo Kilmer. Our guest is a co-director of the RAND Corporation's Drug Policy Research Center, which I just learned is over 20 years uh, established, which is uh, great. His primary field of interest are illicit markets, community corrections, drug treatment, and the use of advanced technologies to help monitor drug and alcohol use among problem populations. Kilmer's current work includes projects to estimate the economic cost of drug use and the evaluations of community level effects of drug treatment. Dr. Kilmer joins us today to discuss the policy implications of marijuana legalization in California nationally and internationally. There has been a dramatic shift in drug policy in recent years. Ballot initiatives have been proposed at the state level and, <coughs> excuse me, and municipalities are today grappling with how to regulate marijuana dispensaries and enforce existing drug law. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kilmer in discussing this fascinating topic. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thanks uh, to all of you for being here. As Chris said, my name is Bo Kilmer. I'm the co-director of the Rand Drug Policy Research Center. For more than 20 years, we've been doing work on a variety of issues related to substance use and drug policy. We have some researchers developing innovative uh, prevention programs, others doing, uh, doing evaluations and assessments of racial disparities in marijuana arrests. We have some folks who are doing kind of high-level statistical analyses of data from undercover drug busts. And with all of these projects, the, uh, the goal is to provide objective research and analysis to decision makers. And so lately I've been working on a project looking at marijuana legalization in California. And uh, this is definitely a, a team project, and I got to be a part of a great team. I got to work with John Calkins at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Rosalie Pakula, who's the other co-director of the Rand Drug Policy Research Center. Got to work with Rob McCoon at UC Berkeley and uh, Peter Reuter at the University of Maryland. And in addition, we actually had a number of uh, students from Carnegie Mellon University actually doing a lot of the background research, and uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this without them, so thanks. So as you know, uh, marijuana legalization is a hot topic in California, and most of the focus right now is on two different proposals. The first proposal is Assembly Bill uh, 2254, uh, often referred to as the Amiano Bill. And what this bill would do is it would legalize marijuana for those who are 21 and older, and it would uh, put the California Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control in charge of regulating the production and distribution of marijuana. And initially, they would place a $50 an ounce excise tax on marijuana. Last year, the California Board of Equalization did an analysis and said that at $50 an ounce, uh, this would bring in $1.4 billion in tax revenue to uh, California each year. The other proposal being considered is the Regulate, Control, and Tax Cannabis Proposition. This is what's going to be on the ballot in uh, November 2010. This initiative would also uh, legalize marijuana for those over uh, those 21 and older, and would also make it legal to cultivate your own 5x5 plot uh, in your home. The interesting twist here is instead of having statewide regulation, it would allow each local jurisdiction to have the power to uh, regulate production and come up with their own tax rates. Uh, and, but, and just to kind of put this in perspective, uh, I mean, what's hap what these proposals really are kind of revolutionary. And no other place in the world have we legalized the production and distribution of marijuana. You know, a lot of people like to think, well, you know, in, you know, when you go to Amsterdam, it's legal, and no. While it's legal to go to a coffee shop in the Netherlands and buy five grams, it's still illegal to produce it. So it's kind of, it's legal in the front door, illegal in the back door. So... I mean, to the extent that this hasn't happened in other places, I mean, it's really unclear about trying to project what would happen. Uh, you know, there's a lot, of you know, a lot of debate, and there's actually a lot of rhetoric in this debate. So the goal of our analysis really was to just focus on two issues. One, try to, uh, try to understand how legalization of marijuana in California could influence consumption, and then also look at how legalization could influence public budgets. And I want to make it very clear that the... We did not, we neither had the time nor the resources to do a comprehensive cost-benefit analysis. I mean, our goal wasn't to, you know, come out and say, you know, this would be a good idea for California or this would be a bad idea for California. Uh, similarly, um, we're not trying to tell people how to vote on the initiative. I mean, RAND doesn't take positions on ballot initiatives or uh, specific, uh, you know, specific uh, bills uh, being considered. 
I mean, we really don't have a horse in this race. We just wanted to kind of provide some objective information to actually help guide the discussion we'll be having for the next five months here in California, and I'm sure we'll continue to have this debate and discussion uh, after November. So today I want to briefly just talk about how we built this model and then go into some of the key insights. So, you know, we begin with this logic model where you can see on the left-hand side you've got your choice variables. You know, when you legalize, you make a choice to uh, remove the sanctions for possession and sales. And then you also have to make decisions about the regulatory regime, the tax rates. Um, on the right-hand side, you have these octagons are kind of the outcomes that we cared about. You know, marijuana consumption and also the net impact on uh, state and local budgets. And as you can imagine, I mean, these policy decisions have direct and indirect effects. And I'm not going to walk you through each of these different boxes and arrows uh, during the presentation, um, but I want to make it very clear that we were systematic about this. And so for each of these intermediary boxes, we actually not only had to come up with a point estimate, but we also had to kind of come up with a range. And so when we could, you know, we looked at the peer-reviewed literature for a lot of these boxes. There wasn't a lot there in the scientific literature. I went to the gray literature. I went to greenhouses, talked to farmers, talked to people at medical marijuana dispensaries. And we did a lot of different things in order to kind of come up with these ranges. And I mean, while this is useful in terms of kind of making projections for the model, just the idea of kind of bringing all that literature together for each of these boxes turned out to yield some of our most important insights. So now let's talk about some of the key insights. And kind of the main takeaway from the analysis is that we expect that the pre-tax retail price of marijuana to drop substantially post-legalization, probably on the order of 80, 90 percent. Right now, if you want to get an ounce of Cincinnati in California, and this is your high-quality marijuana, it's going to run you between $300 to $450. Um, and just want to make it clear for the analyses, we actually had, ended up having to convert everything into Cincinnati equivalents because we know that most of California isn't using Cincinnati right now. But in order to get an idea about what happens to the price post-legalization, you actually have to make some assumptions about what, what, what would production look like. You know, we just don't know. So we kind of costed out four different, mod four different approaches. One being, you know, we would allow everyone to do their own private hydroponic 5x5 five five plot. Uh, another uh, mode of production we looked at was allowing uh, residential grow houses, where it, uh, assume it's a $1,500 or 1,500 square foot grow house, where 300 square feet would uh, be uh, devoted to, uh, to uh, production. Then you also have greenhouse farms and then unfettered outdoor farms. You know, we costed it out for each of those. But ultimately, we had to make a decision uh, about which one we thought would be most likely in order to do the projections. And we ended up focusing on the grow houses for a few reasons. First of all, if you're a jurisdiction and you're trying to make money off of uh, taxi marijuana, the 5x5 five five plots, that's just inefficient. You're not going to get that much. And with, respect, and with respect to greenhouse farms or kind of unfettered outdoor farms, uh, you know, we don't know what the federal government's going to do. But we thought that the federal government would probably have a problem with all these greenhouses and unfettered farms up and down I-5. You know, I want to make it very clear. We don't know what the feds are going to do, but we thought so... We felt comfortable make, basing our assumptions on this grow house model. And with the grow houses, or in fact with any of these kind of modes of production, there are a number of, number of reasons why you would expect the, uh, uh, the cost of production to go down. First of all, you're getting rid of the risk. Right now, when you buy cocaine, when you buy heroin, when you buy marijuana, a lot of what you're paying for is to actually compensate the dealer and everyone, everyone else in the supply chain for their, you know, their risk of arrest, their risk of incarceration. That will go away with legalization. You also have to, and there's also going to be a decreased risk of asset forfeiture. You also have to think about automation, too. I mean, right now, when you're trimming buds, that's a very labor-intensive process. I mean, they now have machines which, have, which are much more efficient at doing this. And you're going to expect those machines not only to be more available post-legalization, but also cheaper. And in fact, people wouldn't necessarily even have to buy them. You could actually just, you, you probably could just rent some of these machines in order to help trim, you know, when it's time to actually manicure. And then finally, also economies of scale. I mean, it's one thing if you have one or two grow houses, but if you're able to actually have 15, 16 grow houses, then you can start really buying the fertilizer, the nutrients, and kind of the other substances in bulk. And so one could imagine that there would be savings there. So there's a lot of theory about, well, that we would expect the price to be low. But then we went and just tried to figure it out. Okay, assuming that we have a grow house and knowing how much lighting it would require, how much labor it would require, what would it actually cost to produce a pound of Cincinnati? range we came up with was, with, uh, was between $200 and $400 a pound. Uh, so if you're trying to figure out what the retail price would, you'd have to add on your wholesaler markups, retailer markups, distribution. When all said and done, 
uh, we expect that post-legalization, an ounce of Cincinnati pre-tax would run less than $40. That's a big difference from the 300 to 450 that you see in the market right now. Uh, and just to kind of put this in perspective, some others have tried to estimate this, and our estimate kind of falls in those ranges. Uh, the Board of Equalization and Myron, they both put it at 50%. Uh, the head of the, Geringer here, the head of the California, Depart uh, California uh, Division of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws testified last year that, you know, hey, at you can begin with $300 an ounce, but post-legalization, when it's unregulated, it would only end up being on the order of a few dollars per ounce. Um, so ultimately, we're most comfortable saying that post-legalization, we expect the price to drop at least 80%. Leads us to our next point that, you know, we expect consumption is going to increase post-legalization, but it's unclear how much. Right, there are two reasons for this post-legalization. First of all, you have these non-price effects, right? For some people, it's going to change the stigma they'll be more likely to use. But then you also have to be thinking about uh, advertising and promotion. For those reasons, you would expect use to take up a little bit. But then obviously, also, when you have such a large price drop, you would expect there to be price effects. We know that users and potential users are sensitive to the prices of marijuana. Um, but in order to do that, you really have to have a good idea about uh, how, uh, how sensitive consumers are to these price changes. And for you economists out there, you have to have a good idea about the price elasticity of demand. Thing is, is what this price drop that you would see in marijuana is going to be large. And it's something we've never seen before. And so when you're talking about changes that large, it actually requires that you know what the demand curve looks like. I mean, if we're talking about something small, the shape of the demand curve does not matter as much. But for this, it actually it makes a difference about your assumptions. And, you know, and the thing is, is we don't know what the demand curve for marijuana actually looks like. So for our analyses, we focus on two demand curves, which are kind of common in the literature, which you learn about in introductory econ, you know, constant elasticity demand and a linear demand curve. But we want to make very clear that we, we're not, we don't know if either of these is correct. But for analysis, we just wanted to see, well, how would the results change, you know, depending on one's assumption about the shape of the demand curve? And the takeaway from this chart is that it matters a lot. Your assumptions about the demand curve are really going to influence your projections about consumption. On the y-axis here, we have the percent increase in consumption post-legalization. And on the x-axis, we actually have the percent of consumption that evades sales taxes, because we actually don't know how much tax evasion is going to happen. But just focus here at the, uh, you know, at the y-axis. Assuming, uh, assuming a linear demand curve, a $50 an ounce tax, no tax evasion, a perfectly elastic supply curve, we would expect that post-legalization, the, the consumption would increase about 76%. Now keep all that constant and just switch out the linear demand curve for the constant elasticity demand curve, and that goes to uh, about 150%. Now, once again, we want to be very clear. We don't know if either of these is correct, but this, is a, this assumption actually makes a big difference. And uh, oftentimes, when, when individuals are doing these analyses, they just kind of make an assumption and don't think about it. But we say it actually does matter. Minor assumptions have major implications when you're thinking about uh, how to project the effects of marijuana legalization. Third point is that tax evasion could be a major concern, especially if the tax rates are set too high. Um, I mean, the obvious comparison product here is tobacco. We know that when tobacco taxes are too high, folks are more likely to buy from the internet, go to an Indian reservation. You know, there are these great stories in Canada where a few of the provinces added on a $3 a pack tax on, uh, on tobacco, and there ended up being so much tax evasion, they actually had to repeal the taxes. Um, we do know that, um, we know that tobacco tax evasion does happen in California. We don't know how much. I mean, some people have put it at 1% to 4%. Uh, Board of Equalization came out about 10 years ago saying it ranged, ranged between 12 to 27. We don't know exactly where that is, but we know that it happens. But to kind of put this in perspective, in no state is the excise tax for an ounce of tobacco more than $5. What's being, promote, what's being um, um, initially introduced with the Amiano bill is a $50 an ounce tax. That's pretty high. Um, and just forget about ounces for a moment. Let's actually think about pounds. The financial, if, if you assume that the tax is going to be $50 an ounce, the financial reward for not paying that tax is going to be between $800 and $850 because you also have to account for the sales tax. I mean, that's more than it actually costs to buy a pound of marijuana from Mexico right now. 
So, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty here, and we don't come up with a specific point estimate, but we do want to make it very clear that if you do set the tax too high, you could have this, uh, you could have a fair amount of evasion. And what's interesting about that is not only will evasion reduce the amount of revenue going to the state, but all, or state or local governments, but when you have more evasion, that means that the consumers are actually facing a lower price. So you, you actually expect more of an, a larger increase in use. Fourth point is all about criminal justice costs in terms of how much money we actually spend enforcing marijuana laws in California. Um, the takeaway here is be th if you're thinking about this, be thinking about hundreds of millions of dollars, not billions. Um, you know, there are, you know, a lot of people like to say, you know, if we were to legalize marijuana, we would free up all these resources and we use that money for, you know, education, we could use it for, you know, other services. Uh, right now, there are kind of before uh, we looked into this, there were two other estimates out there about how much California spends enforcing marijuana laws. Um, one put it at 200 million, the other one put it at close to 2 billion a year. I mean, that's an order of magnitude difference. So we thought, okay, well, let's just figure this out. I mean, this is not rocket science. Give me the number of arrests, the number of people incarcerated, information about adjudication, we can throw on some unit costs. I can get a pretty good ballpark figure of what it would be. And when we did that, we estimated that probably each year, less than $300 million is spent enforcing marijuana laws, you know, in terms of uh, these are funds spent by, Cal by the state and the local governments. Uh, we also have to remember is that this doesn't necessarily mean savings. I mean, it's not as if, you know, if it were to be legalized, that money is going to go back into the general fund. That money is probably going to stay with the local law enforcement, stay with Department of Corrections. Now, no, it may be the case that that money will be better spent. I mean, that's something we didn't look at. But just when people are talking about this, I mean, yeah, be thinking, be thinking in the millions, not in the billions. And finally, the revenue estimates that the Board of Equalization came up with, that 1.4 billion, um, we can think of a number of reasons why that number could actually be dramatically lower or dramatically higher. First of all, there are four reasons why, we, why one could expect the tax revenues coming into California to be less than 1.4 billion. First of all, tax evasion. We don't know what it's going to be, but if the tax rate is set high enough, we expect there to be evasion. Uh, when the Board of Equalization did its analysis, it uh, assumed there would be no evasion. So to the extent there would be evasion, you expect that to lower it. Um, also, we expect a larger drop in prices. So if, there is, if, if consumers face a lower price, that means the sales tax revenue is also going to be lower than what was projected. Third, one thing that we account for is the fact that there could be the shift, for, uh, shift to higher potency marijuana use post uh, legalization. Right now, we think most of the marijuana consumed in California is commercial grade, not Cincinnati. But it's going to become so cheap post-legalization, we expect that most individuals who are smoking will be smoking since EMEA. And to that extent, you don't have to spend as much to get the same high per an hour. So you would actually, you have to make an adjustment when you're doing these calculations. And so once you do that, once you account for the fact that the, since the excise tax is based on weight, you would expect that, uh, that amount to go down. Finally, the tax rate may not be $50 an ounce. I mean, that was, that's what was initially proposed in the Amiano bill. That's the one that seems to have a lot of currency, but it's very clear that the, uh, with the ballot initiative, it allows each of these jurisdictions to come up with their own estimates. However, the revenues actually could be a lot higher than $1.4 billion if California is actually able to make money off of uh, Cincinnati being exported. Um, so in addition to the report that we have online, um, we actually have nine additional working papers which provide the background calculations for a lot of what we're doing. And in one of those chapters by Brittany Bond and John Calkins, they actually estimate smuggling costs, what it costs to smuggle marijuana from Humboldt as well as from Mexico. And so assume that we have this big price drop, assume that the tax is going to be $50 an ounce, add on these smuggling costs, we still expect that Cincinnati coming from California will still be competitive with a lot of the Cincinnati being sold in the rest of the country. So there is a chance that California could actually make a lot of revenue. If individuals come to California, they buy it, then they take it back. But the big question is, is you know, if someone from Michigan drives to California, loads up their car full you know, several pounds, um, are they going to buy it and pay taxes? Are they going to buy it above board? Or are they going to try to buy it on this gray market? That's what we don't know. But there actually is this possibility that California could make a fair amount of money if it can make money off these exports. But so much of that's really going to depend on what the federal response is. And we don't know what the feds are going to do. And on one hand, the feds could step up enforcement, or they could do what they did in the, uh, in the 80s when they wanted to raise the minimum legal drinking age. They didn't pass a law saying, you know, you know the drinking age has to be 21. What they said is if you want all of your federal highway funds, your drinking age better be 21. And so there, you can imagine something like that happening with this. Um, 
I mean, that, and, I mean, right now I think California gets at least $3 billion uh, in federal highway funds. I mean, assume that, you know, they would lose 10% of that. Even if they lost 10%, that'd be $300 million. I mean, that could offset or more than offset some of the revenue coming in. Um, on the other hand, like I said, if the feds are kind, of, are kind of hands off about this and they don't get involved, it actually could make it easier to make money off of exporting it to uh, marijuana to other states. And in that case, actually, California, we would expect more money to come in. But like we said, we don't know what the feds are going to do, and we also don't know what the other states would do, too. We don't know what, how, how Nevada would react if all of a sudden people just kept driving across the border and then, uh, and then heading back to Vegas to sell. So in terms of conclusions, um, decision makers, whether they are policymakers or voters, you need to be skeptical of estimates that claim precision. If someone comes up to you and says, you know, legalization, we think it's going to increase consumption by this amount or, you know, it's going to bring in this much in revenues and they feel that that number is pretty precise, be skeptical. We show that there's a lot of uncertainty here, not only with respect to tax evasion, but also with the, uh, the, uh, the shape of the demand curve. This is such a large drop that, uh, it, I mean, it requires a lot of assumptions. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. Second, we know that consumption is going to increase, but it's unclear by how much. I mean, with our models, we can't rule out increases of 50 to 100 percent, perhaps more, but we don't really know. But one thing to kind of keep in mind is if you took the, the, the prevalence rate that we have today in California for the number of people who smoked pot in the past 30 days, which I think is 6.5 percent, if you were to double that, you know, and assume 100 percent increase and say it was, uh, you know, close to 13, we'd be back to where we were in 1978. So, it, I mean, that, as, that is a world that we've seen before. I mean, granted, marijuana now is, an, is, more, is stronger. I mean, we have less disco. But, I mean, we actually have seen a world where there have been um, many more uh, marijuana smokers. Um, and I want to be very clear. We don't, we're not necessarily saying that we think it's going to double. But, you know, you're going to be seeing more of these estimates coming out for the next five months. So, we, for us, this is actually a useful bright line for thinking about how to interpret, you know, what that world could possibly look like. And finally, the evidence base for this analysis is severely limited. You know, so much of the economics literature is all focused on um, marginal changes. You know, if there's a $3 increase in the price of marijuana, how does that include influence consumption? These are all marginal. We realize that uh, legalizing marijuana in California would not be a marginal change. So to that extent, it really calls into question how much we can actually rely on the existing literature in order to inform our projections about uh, marijuana legalization in California. With that, I'll close. I look forward to your questions and comments, and I guess I'm supposed to say that this concludes our videotaped portion of the, uh, the talk. So, thanks. Thank you.